It's good to see you all out this morning. My grandfather told me many years ago not to ever, or that he would rather I never preach series sermons, so I don't call them that. But in the middle of the sermon last week, we mentioned Galatians chapter 3. It was the funny slide with the last word cut off. And we talked about how under the law of Moses, sin was. That that was the purpose of the law of the Moses, to show what is perfect. And when you show what perfect is, you can measure against perfect. And you can measure against perfect and realize all of the things that are not perfect. The law was to be a tutor, a guardian, something that showed us what perfect was, what would be coming. Our Jesus, our Messiah, come to be perfect according to that law that we would be able to see Him and recognize Him. The old law educates us on how much it takes to be righteous before God. We're not under the old law. That's why we call it the old law. We're under the law, the perfect law of liberty. While the old law educates us on how to be righteous before God, the new law perfects you so that you are righteous before God. The old law had to be kept perfectly. If it couldn't be kept perfectly, if you couldn't do everything, if you couldn't remember all of the rituals, if you couldn't celebrate all of the feasts, if your priest for you could not offer the sacrifices that you brought in a perfect way, then you were guilty. You were guilty of the entire law. Because if you broke one point of the law, you were a lawbreaker. Forever from then on, you were a lawbreaker. In this country, we make certain criminals register anywhere they go. There's a registry, and you can look them up online, that says that at one time, this person was an offender of this type. And they have to register every time they move with the sheriff's office or with with law enforcement in some capacity that you know where they are. You know how many of them are in your community and you know where they live. Under the old law, that was everyone. Lawbreakers. Ones that couldn't keep the law. Ones that could not abide by it. And if you were guilty of one piece, one transgression, one one little bitty infraction, and you were guilty of the entire law. So what's changed? Under that law, there was a prophecy. Prophesied in Isaiah chapter 2, starting in verse 2, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of all mountains. He shall be lifted up above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that He may teach us His ways, that we may walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord, from Jerusalem. It was prophesied that there would be what Paul calls the law of Christ. That is the law that we're under now. Whenever God looks at your life and says whether there is sin in your life or righteousness in anyone's life, then it is measured against the perfect law of liberty. Paul calls it here in 1 Corinthians 9.21, the law of Christ. And we're given one of the most powerful statements in the entire Bible in Romans chapter 8. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the new law. Him. And if you're in Him, free. So simple. So easy. So open and and standard to say it it sounds good. If you are in Christ, you are free. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's a lot of qualifications and there's a lot of doctrine and there's a lot of things to do after that. But don't get caught up after that. There are things there. But this is written as it is. Without those qualifications added on, the entire 8th chapter is an encouraging chapter. It's written this way so that you'll stop for just a moment and say, I'm free. Stop for just a moment 
and say, I'm free. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Whenever it is said, how how could you keep the whole law? You say, I can't, but I'm in Christ and he can. He kept the entire law perfectly and He did it for me. And He is what I can point to as perfect. He did it for me. James calls His law, the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty. And indeed, most of the discussion of the perfect law of liberty comes from the book of James. It's considered that the book of James was the very first book that was written and mass distributed to the Christians. I don't know how much of that is true. I wasn't around back then. But it's supposed to have been written somewhere in 46 AD, so about 13 years after Jesus returns to heaven. And in James chapter 1 and verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So why does James call the law of Christ the perfect law? Well, perfect for three reasons. First, James has already said earlier in the chapter that it was given by a perfect God. That our perfect God gives all good and perfect gifts, including and by His Word. So number one, it is a perfect law because it is the law preferred by a perfect God. Number two, it's perfect because it is given in completeness. It's the whole law. There's no extra. There's no lesser. There's no outside angle at which God is going to, to judge and say, well, there was this standard that will be added later. There's no golden tablets that can be discovered by uh, somebody who sails a whole continent away. There's no more. It was given to the apostles. The apostles gave it to us. It was delivered by the Holy Spirit. And it is perfect in completeness. It is perfect in a third way. Because it perfects us for righteousness. The job, the task, the thing that it does is perfect you for righteousness. And you say, I'm not perfect. No, you're not. But by the law, you're given grace so that you can lean on the perfection of the law. The old law educates us on what it takes to be righteous before God. The new law perfects you so that you are righteous before God. After becoming a Christian, you look and say, what is it that saves me? Because I've done wrong things. It doesn't take long after you come out of the water. Maybe day, maybe ten days, maybe ten minutes. At some point you infract the law again. What's different about you now? You're saved by grace. You're given the grace of God. We add so much to this. And there is. First of all, the writing is given to the Ephesians. It's a group of Christians. It's not given to a group of non-Christians. As Christians, you are saved by grace through faith. Not because of the things that we do. Not because of the actions that we participate in. Not because we're good people or because we try to be good people. You're saved by grace. By the grace of God. You're not a lawbreaker. You don't have to go and register and say, I was a lawbreaker and I I had this infraction. There was this part of the law that I could not keep. As you sin and you bring that back to God, it's absolved. Gone. Grace and mercy covered. Well, if that's the case, why do we have to do anything? Perhaps we should continue in sin that grace may abound. There is literally that verse in the book of Romans. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer that is given is by no means. We act as if we've already been paid. So we continue to work. We actually pick up and do what God says because He has rewarded us. 
James covers in the uh, in James chapter one, starting in verse 25, 26 there, what it means to be saved. If you're saved, what are you going to do? Being uh, looking into the law will cause action. And if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. If you think that you're saved, if you think that you're a Christian, but you're not doing anything about it, that's worthless. That's what it says right here. James says, if you're not acting like a Christian, you're not. You can be baptized. If you get up and do nothing about God later, it doesn't work for you. You've got to do something. What are you doing? Step one, what, what can we do? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction. What's not listed here? What's not listed here? Thou shalt not. When Moses receives the law, he's given like 613 commands. We, we see 10 of them real quick. They're put on plaques. We know what they are. Many of us can recite them. We teach them to children in, in Bible classes so that they will know what they are. And the world puts great emphasis on them still. But whenever God is giving the perfect law of liberty and He says, if you are keeping your religion correctly, if you are acting like a good Christian, what He starts with is not, thou shalt not. He starts with, what are you doing for each other? What are you doing for your widows? What are you doing for your orphans? Those who are afflicted. Those who are in need. Those who are destitute. What are you doing for people that need things? Because that's what being a Christian is. That's, that's the actions that we're supposed to take. Those are the more important tenets. Taking care of one another. We're not supposed to be the people who can't have fun. The people who can't participate in. The people who are fuddy-duddies and just sit around and, and read a book all day. We're people that show each other love. That show other people love. We're supposed to be known by our love. And that's where James starts. What are you doing for one another? He also says to keep oneself unstained by the world. A quote from a preacher named Ben Walker. You cannot have grace where there is no law because if there is no law, then there is no sin. <laughs> to keep oneself unstained by the world is moving forward. It's trying. It's working and doing things, being a doer of the law and not a hearer only because we realize that there is sin in the world. You can't be a light where there is no darkness because everything's just the same. Because there is sin in the world, we want to show people that there's a different way. There's a different path. There's something different that you're supposed to be doing. When you become a Christian, you're supposed to change what's going on in your life. A butterfly is an ugly little worm. A butterfly is an ugly little worm. And as a Christian... You should be the butterfly that flits down next to those ugly little worms and says you can change. Through the power of Christ, you can change. You realize I just called the entire world ugly little worms. Because sin is ugly. And if we will wrap ourselves in the love of Christ, in the sacrifice that He made in the watery grave of baptism, then we can come out of that chrysalis a beautiful butterfly able to serve and glorify His name. So speak and so act as those who are judged under the law of liberty. Don't say, I can't do things. Say, I can. Look what I can do. Look how I can glorify God. How do we reconcile? Show mercy. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. This may be one of the scariest things in the whole Bible. I'm a Christian. I try to act like a Christian. I move forward trying to be a Christian. Can you believe they wore that? Merciless behavior. Merciless speech. Hypercritical activity against one another or against other people. 
mercy triumphs over judgment. If God is going to judge me based off of the mercy that I show to other people, how quick do we tell them that they're sinners? How quick do we tell them what they did wrong? How quick do we tell them that's a condemned behavior? It's important, absolutely. But how do I want God to bring that on me? We can't condone sin. We don't want to condone sin. But we don't want to be merciless either. I want grace from my God. I need grace from my God. I need mercy from my God. Do you know who I am? Maybe you don't. I know He does. And if I need His mercy and I need His grace, how can I show that to someone else? How God like it. To show grace and mercy. They don't deserve it. Neither did we. Neither do we. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? And we point here and we say, look, that means that faith is doing something. Okay, that's, you're correct. Now pick up the mirror. What am I doing? Faith is doing something. What am I doing? Because God didn't say, come sit in a pew. Read your Bible, pick it up, open it cover to cover. God does not say, come sit in a pew. So that don't count. That don't count. This don't count. What are your activities? What are your actions? What is your heart doing? Are we known by our love? Are we visiting widows and orphans, the afflicted, the oppressed? What are we doing? How are we showing mercy and grace? The law of liberty. When I was young, I had this idea. Rules are easy. They're written down. How how easy is the Ten Commandments, right? It just literally is a list. Number one, do this. Number one, do this. Number two. It goes right down. This is how you act. So I'm okay, cool. Pop open the New Testament. Where's the where's the protocol? Rule number one, do this. Rule number two, do that. Rule number three. Where's the protocol? The law isn't about the protocol. The law is focusing on grace. Focusing on faith. Showing love to one another and acting God-like. It's not about following rules. The law that God has given us is not about following rules. It's about showing mercy. It's about not sinning. Well, those are rules. Yeah, those are rules. Because He says don't sin. And he gives lists of sins and it says don't do those. So don't do those. But the point is not to not do something. The point is to look more like God. The point is to show grace like God. So what am I doing as a Christian? I'm trying to be more God-like. I'm trying to show more mercy. I'm trying to show more grace. That starts to sound like anyone who is becoming more mature. As I get older, I want to slow down. I want to listen to people more. I want to pay more attention to them. I want to be able to sit down and have conversations with them. I want to understand who they are. All of those things are showing more God-like qualities. I want to show them more grace. I don't want to cut them off because I need to go do something else. The perfect law of liberty is about looking more like God. Not about worrying what the rules are. Can I, can I technically do this? Is it technically cheating on my wife if I only kiss the other woman? How close to God-like looking is that? Is it close to gossip if I, I only want you to know because you probably need to know it involves you two somewhere along the lines? We're not trying to find out where the lines are so that we can get close to them. We're trying to look more like God. And if we're trying to figure out what the lines are so that we can know how to blur them, then our focus is not on looking more like Christ. It is on the rules. That is what He came to save us from. The rules. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God doesn't need us to focus on the rules. He needs us to focus on looking more like Him. Again, 
I'm not trying to absolve and say that there are no rules. Without rules, there can be no grace. But our focus is on His grace, His salvation, His love, and His mercy. John chapter 8, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Him, If you abide in My Word, you are truly My disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered Him, We are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you can say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Have we been living free lives? You notice that what he says is, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So you say, if I step on this side of the line, the good side, not the bad things, that I would do as a worldly person over here, but the good things, that I would abide in Him. But He says where He leads, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth doesn't say that I would step on His side and abide in Him and continue walking forward. That I would just turn and go away from the line altogether and start living free. I don't need to know how closely worded the rules are and the definition in the Greek versus the meaning in English with 16 different commentaries that would say, well, technically, if you don't say God, you can't use His name in vain. I'm stepping so far away from what close to the rules is and living a free life, one that shows mercy, one that shows grace. Not that there are no rules, but that we're not living near breaking them. We're being more righteous. We have our mind set on the Spirit and we're living Spirit-filled lives, not rule-filled lives. (coughs) If you need help getting to that place, needing to fix your relationship with God as a Christian. Let's fix that this morning. That's what His disciples are supposed to be doing. His disciples are supposed to be walking away from the rules and walking to His mercy, to His love, to His grace. You become His disciple as He commands in Matthew chapter 28 in in verse 19 Disciples are made by being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and observing the things that He commands. If you haven't become a disciple, this is how you do it. Let's do that this morning. We have water. We can baptize you and you can be a Christian. Because if you're not baptized, you may act kind of Christian-like or you may associate with Christians. You may think Christian-like thoughts. But if you haven't been baptized, you're not a Christian. If you'd like to become one this morning, to live in His mercy and His grace, make it known. Come forward as we stand and sing.